The Haunted Vagina by Carlton Merrick III. A Wonderland book. N no, that's... Okay, never mind. I fucked up the intro, but that's fine. Other Works by Carlton Mer Merrick III. Satan Burger. Um... The Menstruating Mall, Ocean of Lard, uh, uh, War Slut, Adolf in Wonderland, <laughs> Ultrafuckers, um, The Eggman, The Faggiest Vampire, um, Warrior Wolf Women of the Wasteland, Zombies and Shit, uh, The Morbidly Obese Ninja, uh, armadillo fists. Um, cuddly holocaust. Uh, and as she stabbed me gently in the face. The Haunted Vagina by Carlton Melick III. Author's note. I miss Andre the Giant. Carlton Melick III. Chapter 1 I've been scared to have sex with Stacy ever since I discovered her vagina was haunted. When we first met, I didn't notice her vagina was haunted at all. It seemed perfectly fine. Better than fine. It was great. At least for the first year. But after we got engaged and she moved in with me, I noticed odd sounds coming from her while she slept. At first, I thought it was just her snoring. Then I thought there was a television left on somewhere in the house. I heard voices in the dark, whispers, and then laughs, then cries, then howls. The sounds were muffled, but seemed to, be, seemed to become clearer and clearer with each passing night. Where the heck are those noises coming from? I asked Stacy one evening. She blinked herself awake. Huh? I hear noises coming from the walls, I said. Oh, she said. I'm serious, I said. That's not coming from the walls, she said. It's coming from me. From you? From inside me, she said, pulling off the covers and pointing at her crotch. I snorted at her. Listen. Nope, sorry. Listen, she said, pulling my head into her lap and pressing my ear against her vagina. It was like listening to the ocean in a hairy flesh seashell. You're playing, I said. She giggled. It was all a joke. But then I heard it. A voice inside of her. I couldn't understand the words. A woman crying, babbling in a deranged language. Then she screamed into my ear and I jumped out from between Stacy's legs. My girlfriend laughed at me, squinting her dark brown eyes. What the hell? I screamed. Told you, she said. What was that? A ghost, she said. What? I'm haunted, she said touching her vagina and smiling. How did a ghost get in there? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, she said. <laughs> it's been there, it's been in there for a long time now. Why don't you do anything about it? I asked. What can I do? I don't know, call a priest. What's a priest going to do? Stick a cross up there and cast the spirits out? Maybe. It's not really that big a deal. I've gotten used to it. How? Actually, I kind of like it. I frowned at a, I frowned at a sailboat on the wall behind her. What? I frowned at a sailboat on the wall behind her. Yeah, she said, spreading her legs across my lap. Who else has a haunted vagina? She, flat she flattened the bush of pubic hair and spread the lips to examine it. My other boyfriends thought it was kind of sexy. I shook my head at her as she smiled. I found it repulsive, but the fact that I was scared of her vagina seemed to turn her on. She made love to me after that. For her, it was the wildest sex we ever had. She had me pinned down underneath her, sucking on my crusty lower lip sliding my penis into her ghostly regions and getting off on the terrified look on my face. But for me, it was the most awkward sex I'd ever had. I swear I could feel strange things inside of her that night. 
ghostly breaths against the tip of my dick. It's not the chapter. I have to keep reading. Fucking hell. But we were madly in love. I didn't even consider leaving her because of her ghost vagina. It meant everything to me. I loved her this much. That means indefinitely. There's a symbol on the page. Can't read that out. I've been consumed by her ever since the day we met. We were strangers who somehow passed out on a city, on a city bus together. My head in her lap. Her curly brown hair encasing me like a blanket. Hot breath on the back of my neck. When she woke, she said, That was cosy. And I smiled at her. She was very tall, especially for an Asian girl. Almost a foot taller than me. With silky curled hair and tiny oval glasses. Then she said she had a snuggly bed at her place if we wanted to continue sleeping. I agreed. I thought she wanted to have sex. The whole walk home, my eyes were glossy at her, trying to hide my heart on under my coat. But she really just wanted to sleep. It was late. Both of us worked the swing shift. We went into her studio apartment, the floor covered with laundry that she insisted was all clean, and stripped down to our shirts, underwear and socks. She was right. It was definitely a comfortable bed. It was the biggest, fluffiest bed I'd ever been in. She snuggled me like a teddy bear all night. We didn't even know each other's names, but it was one of the nicest moments I've ever spent with another person. The next morning, we introduced ourselves. Steve, she said, hopping out of bed to the kitchen counter. I hate that name. I could see her cocoa nipples through her t-shirt. She must have taken her bra off sometime during the night. Sorry, I said. Ha ha, she said, eating Lucky Charms out of the box. When do you want to do this again? She asked me. I shrugged. Tonight? She asked. I nodded, pulling on my pants. On the way out the door, she said, Meet you on the bus. For three weeks, we slept in the same bed together. We never had sex. We never kissed. We never took off more clothes than our pants. We just dreamed together. The conversations were brief. We didn't go on any dates. We didn't get to know each other. It was just a sleeping arrangement. To her, I was just a stuffed animal with a heartbeat. <clears throat> but eventually, we started to talk. I found out her favourite food was stuffed grape leaves and her favourite films were all in Russian. She was born in Thailand, but was adopted by a wealthy African-American couple before she could walk and spent most of her life in an upscale suburb outside Los Angeles. She spent 10 years at the university here in Portland, getting degrees in every subject she could acquire. She wasn't interested in a career. She just liked learning new things. Um, she just liked learning new things, and her parents paid for everything until she, was, until she turned 30. That's when they cut her off and she had to drop out to get a job. Unfortunately, her degrees in f philosophy, history, Russian, anthropology, psychology and humanities were useless in the job market so she worked at one of the hipster clothing stores downtown. That's when she decided her real passion in life was fashion design, and she'd been saving up her money to go back to school ever since. I never went to college. Nope. I never went to college, I told her. Never ever, she asked. I was busy trying to be a musician. I sang and played guitar. I wanted to be like Beck or the guy from Soul Coughing, but after ten years of going nowhere, I gave up. Crowds just didn't like me. Nightclubs stopped booking me for shows. I kept playing my music at open mic night at Produce Row, but eventually quit. I got sick of the lack of applause. I got sick of people ignoring me, talk talking at their tables like I wasn't even there. It was just a big waste of time. Did playing your music make you happy? She asked. Yes, I said. Then it wasn't a waste of time, she said. That's when I realised I was in love with her. I didn't realise she was in love with me for months after that. She, al she always said I was cute and small, but that didn't prove anything. A terrier is also cute and small, and I wanted her to love me more than she'd love a terrier. The day I found out she loved me was the first day we made love. We were walking in the park blocks down by the art museum, talking about music. She told me she wanted to build a theremin and start a band. I asked if I could be in her band. She said no. She wanted to play Schubert and Debussy on the theremin and said that I wouldn't fit in. Then we talked about how she planned to give a theremin rendition of Death and the Maiden, and how she wanted to incorporate it into bondage performance. As we were walking, we passed a grubby homeless man, probably 40 years old, sleeping on a park bench, shivering wet. I recognised him. His name was Donut. 
Or at least, I've heard his friends address him as Donut. Without thinking, I took off my coat and wrapped it around him. It was odd, because I haven't given change to the homeless in years. When I first moved to Portland, I used to, I used to almost daily. If I had change and somebody asked for it, I would give it to them. But I eventually stopped. Mostly because I stopped using cash and was paying for everything with a debit card. I just didn't have change to give away. But they kept asking. Corner after corner, day after day. When did I have change to give? They wouldn't thank me for it. When I apologised for not having change, they would get pissed off and spit on my shoes. Donut happened to be the worst of them. He was a stocky black guy with a bright orange sweater who strolled around Pioneer Square. He wouldn't ask me for change outright. First he would ask me if I had a problem with black people. I would say no. He would then ask me for money. Then I would give it to him, as if that was proof that I truly did not have a problem with black people. He would follow me for a block and ask for a little more. I would give him whatever I had, even a dollar or two. Then he'd ask for a little more. If I ever refused him, he would call me a racist. He'd say, Oh, I see now you're a skinhead. Well, see Kyle, skinhead. He'd continue yelling at me until I was two blocks away. See Kyle, see Kyle. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. Is my fucking door closed? So after half a dozen confrontations like that, I avoided all interaction with the homeless. I didn't even make eye contact. But on that day, walking in the park blocks, I gave my $200 coat to Donut, the same homeless guy who called me a racist for not giving him money. I'm not sure why I did it. I didn't want to give him the coat. I didn't do it because I had something to prove. I just saw a guy freezing on a park bench, covered him with my coat and continued on. Maybe it was because I was with Stacy. Maybe because I was just so happy walking next to her that it made me want to make somebody else happy too. I don't know. But after she saw me give away my coat as if it were the most common thing to do in the world, Stacy stopped me in the park, leaned down and kissed me as deeply as she possibly could. And then she told me that she loved me with her shiny dark eyes. That night, we made love. And the next thing I knew, she was moving her big fluffy bed into my place. Not long after that, I ran into Donut again. He was still calling me a Nazi, wearing my $200 coat over his orange sweater. I couldn't stop smiling at him. He seagiled me and I just smiled back. I could tell it just pissed him off even more because he threatened to beat the crap out of me, but I was just so happy that morning that nothing could possibly bother me.